Hello, my name is Leonie and today we are discussing the controversial topic of the tropification of books on TikTok. There has been a bit of a shift in the way that we talk about books. Instead of telling you what a book is about, now people are also talking about books like this. Books that have enemies to lovers, books with fake dating, describing a book as having an arranged marriage, a woman who can kill, aka describing a book based on its common tropes. Now before giving you like some examples of the most popular tropes on TikTok, let's talk about two books that have very original concepts that cannot be simply described in terms of just tropes. I received these from the sponsor of today's video, which is Book of the Month. Book of the Month is a subscription service where the team curates every month a beautiful list of titles from new and upcoming authors. And then from that list, you choose the books that you're interested in. I chose these two for April. Just for the Summer by Ebi Jimenez. This is about two people who are kind of cursed to always break up with people and then once they've broken up the other person finds the love of their life and here we have a short walk through the wide world this is about a woman who is cursed to die when she stops moving so she is forced to always be moving around and traveling very cool concept so if you also want to save time deciding what to read every month, I highly recommend Book of the Month. It's a wonderful way to discover books that you may not otherwise have heard of. And the book that you chose for the month will be nicely shipped to your doorstep in this super cute blue box. I love having something to look forward to every month. And if you are more of an audiobook person, they now also have a curated list of audiobooks to choose from every month. I think their pricings are just chef's kiss and if you want to get your first book for only five dollars you can do so by using the code pastel it's only for a limited time so make sure you don't miss it and click the link in my description to check out book of the month so a trope is a recurring storytelling device almost every single book has a bunch of tropes by the way sorry it's like really cloudy today so the light is gonna be going really light and then really dark constantly there it goes again. So sorry, I don't think I can fix all of that in editing. Anyway, some of the most popular tropes that you may have heard of are uh, often romance related, like enemies to lovers, fake dating, but there's also morally great characters or female rage if it's a book that focuses on like the anger of a female main character. Or there's even micro tropes, like there's only one bed where the characters get to an inn or hotel and there's only one bed, so now they have to decide if they want to sleep in the same bed together. Or even micro micro tropes that are around a singular sentence, like the who did this to you trope, which happens when one of the characters is injured and then the love interest sees that they're injured and is like, who did this to you? Even better if this trope is combined with the enemies to lovers trope. <laughs> For a lot of people, this is a great way to discover new books that they might like. For example, if you know that you really love it when a romance happens between a very grumpy character and a very happy character, then you know you need to look out for books that have the grumpy ex sunshine trope in them. But as many things that happen on TikTok, it's also sparked a lot of irritation. People claiming that this new way of talking about books based on their tropes is like ruining reading. I find the tropification of literature to be extremely problematic and it keeps new readers from exploring new genres and plots. I say this as someone who enjoys romance occasionally. A romance novel should not be described as one bed, forced proximity, enemies to lovers. I've been reading a bunch of articles and blogs and watching a lot of TikToks to kind of compile all of the complaints that people have about this so-called tropification of books on TikTok. The most common complaints are that it is watering down truly unique and complex stories to just whether the heir and prince of two kingdoms are gonna kiss or not. A lot of people say that it kind of makes every book 
the same. Everything is just enemies to lovers and fake dating nowadays because those are popular tropes. There's no originality anymore. Every book is starting to follow the same structure. So I thought for this video this would be like a great opportunity to have a little bit of a look into the idea of stories following common story structures. Is originality dead? Are we too obsessed with always talking about tropes? Where does it even come from? And are there positives or only negatives to it? I spent like an insane amount of time trying to get the structure of this video right. I think it's gonna be just a, a, a bit of a chaotic chat because we are somehow going to be talking about fan fiction, but also 20th century philosophy. So it's gonna be fun. Strap in. One of the big fears is that because people are always talking about tropes, it's kind of making every book the same. People are afraid that it's going to make stories more surface level, that authors will start writing books around tropes just for marketability when they see that enemies to lovers for example i think is like one of the most popular tropes right now they will just write it into a story around enemies to lovers just so that it'll sell and there will be no depth to the story at all. I do think there's some truth to this like for example enemies to lovers and morally great characters are very hot tropes right now and I've seen a lot of books that are marketed as enemies to lovers, morally grey, rivals to lovers that I'm then very disappointed by because there's just nothing more to these characters or the story than just the fact that I guess like two enemies fall in love. And yes that is a shame and yes I would like to see it otherwise but and I hate to break this to you this is not a new phenomenon. This is not the first time part of the publishing industry kind of sacrifices originality and depth for marketability. Remember when the genre of dystopian books was super popular among young adult audiences because of the success of The Hunger Games and suddenly every book was a dystopian and we got all of these like boring watered down copycats of The Hunger Games just because it could be marketed as a new the new hunger games new dystopian book authors and publishers are always jumping on trends and producing stories that are kind of empty replicas of those trends tiktok tropification has not newly sparked this and yes there's plenty to criticize about how commercialism influences art i'm also not a fan of that but that's not what this video is about i guess what i'm trying to say is that the tropification of tiktok is not like ruining publishing or like newly causing this or anything but just because it's not new doesn't mean that the fear isn't real of course i get it i also don't want every book to suddenly just be like a structural replica of each other i also want to see some originality but also i can't help but squeal every time i'm reading a book and i'm really shipping two characters and then there's a moment where they have to like pretend to date each other <laughs> if it's done well with an emphasis on if it's done well i kind of like it when i see a trope that i've seen a million times before pop up in a novel i'm reading am i part of the problem do we not value originality anymore? Well, I have one question for you. How many times have you watched The Office, okay? How many times have you rewatched the 2005 adaptation of Pride and Prejudice? How many times have you seen the hand scene? <laughs> Don't lie to me. You also find comfort in familiar stories. This is nothing new. Like one historical example that I immediately thought of, of how people have been retelling the same stories over and over again, is the concept of fairy tale retellings. Whether you watched Once Upon a Time when you grew up, or you really like reading like Beauty and the Beast retellings, like A Court of Thorns and Roses is Beauty and the Beast retelling, or you are somehow a person of like the 12th century and you're listening to your local folk teller giving you another iteration of Red Riding Hood. <laughs> fairy tales are stories that are constantly retold in slightly different ways, but they're constantly following the same structure. Apparently, approximately 50 to 75 tales have risen to the fore in the Western world and have been repeatedly retold in diverse forms, rarely in the same way, 
always adapting to the environment and circumstances in which they were generated. In 1928, Vladimir Pope published the morphology of folk tales. He wanted to study Russian folk tales, give a clear scientific description of them through classifying the common story structures. And he found actually 31 common structural elements in Russian folk tales. These are things like the story always starting with a hero leaving the security of their home environment. There's always a moment of trickery where the villain tricks the hero into giving them something that they need. And it almost always ends with a wedding of sorts. He also found seven character archetypes, like an antagonistic villainous character or some kind of magical helper. And after all this categorizing, Prop concluded that all fairy tales are of one type in regard to their structure. And this is just Russian folk tales. There is like a whole index that you can find online that categorizes every folk tale out there, basically. This is the Arna Thompson index that is a tool used to compare folk tales from different cultures. And it shows that folk tales from all sorts of different cultures tend to follow similar structures. It identifies motives in stories. A motive is like the smallest definitive element of a tale. A group of motives that often occurs together or a plot that often occurs is called a tale type. I'll give an example to make it clearer. There is a tale type for the Cinderella type story, also very romantically referred to as tale type 510A. This does not just include the well-known Cinderella story, the German story from the Brothers Grimm, but stories from Norway called Katie Woodencloak, Scotland, the Sharp Grey Sheep, or my favorite from Greece called Little Saddle Slut. <laughs> And all of these stories follow the main story beats of a maid girl who is treated poorly by her stepfamily. She will gain beautiful clothing from a supernatural helping being and so forth. And there's even similar folk tales from Russia, the Philippines and varying Native American culture. And these all follow under the Cinderella tale type or tale type 510A. <laughs> There's a lot of tale types. So structure-wise, all these stories are actually incredibly similar, but that doesn't mean they're all literally the same. They can still vary in very wild ways. Like for example, our girl Little Saddle Slut. <laughs> in this version of the story, um, the evil stepsisters kill and then eat the mother. And then Cinderella, or a little settle slut, <laughs> buries her mother's bones. And then from that, beautiful golden garments arise that she wears to church instead of a ball. But structure-wise, these stories are the same. So it did kind of make me think. If you can say, hey, here's a bunch of stories that all have a Cinderella tale type, is that really so different from saying, well, Here's a bunch of stories that are all enemies to lovers. I know it's not the exact same, but it is kind of looking at stories in terms of their plot structure, right? Because when you know a book is enemies to lovers, you kind of expect a certain structure of the plot. Two characters will start out really hating each other. Enemies, obviously, slowly they will fall in love and in the end, they're lovers. But let's go back to fairy tales for a second. Fairy tales are kind of retold all the time. Let's go back all the way. All the way back when we couldn't write or at least we didn't have any kind of like way of printing books, but we still had stories living in our minds, waiting to be told. There was an oral folk telling tradition. In this time, the stories were told from memory where you were all sitting around a campfire in like a windy forest and you're listening to your local folk teller tell you the story of the wolf in the woods. I'm making this up. I'm assuming that's how it went. That's what I imagine. <laughs> but basically it was very normal back then for stories to constantly like slightly change based on the person that was telling the story. Maybe they always brought their own little spin on things or also based on who you're telling the story to. I mean, I guess you can imagine if you're telling a story to an audience of children or an audience of adults, you might change little elements of the story to kind of like fit your audience. And they would also be kind of altered to fit like 
the culture of the person that's telling the story. So basically it was very normal for stories to be unstable and constantly changing. There wasn't really a concept of an original story. That is until in the 1450s Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press and suddenly we were capable of printing a full story and distributing it to many many people. So we no longer had to tell stories to distribute it to like everyone. People could just like buy a book and read it for themselves and all those copies would be the same. This is really cool because it allowed people to preserve these oral tales when the oral storytelling tradition was like slowly starting to disappear a little bit. It's what the Brothers Grimm did when they went out and just collected folk tales and then published that as the fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm. But I guess you can kind of already see the downside to this because nowadays we tend to think of the Grimm's fairy tales as the original stories. But really, it was just the first time someone put them under the printing press. Now that we had the printing press, we suddenly had this idea of an original story, a canon the truest version of the tale. And there was strong backlash against anyone that tried to sample this original. Published stories needed to be new. Thomas Pettit, professor of culture and language at the University of Southern Denmark, came up with this theory of how the printing press influenced our idea of an original story. And according to him, we now live in kind of a post printing press world. Obviously the printing press still exists, but because of technology, the internet and social media, we're kind of going back again towards constantly retelling stories, just in a different way from back when we did oral storytelling. I mean, think about it. You literally have the internet at your fingertips, literally uh, under your keyboard, under your fingertips. You don't have to rely on like the slowness of the printing press if you want to tell a story. You can just go online and tweet something. <laughs> now I believe there is one amazing example of how in modern times we are constantly retelling stories again as if we're retelling old folk tales. And I'm sure that this is not what Thomas Pettit had in mind when he came up with this theory, but it is. <laughs> Fan fiction is basically people retelling existing stories. For example, maybe you're a big fan of Harry Potter, so there are a lot of Harry Potter fan fictions out there that slightly change things. Like for example, Harry Potter, but Draco and Harry fall in love. There's, there's a lot of those. There's so many of those. When I was 15, I distinctly remember being so distraught by the ending of the Hunger Games trilogy that I had to soothe myself by reading a fan fiction of Mockingjay or like post Mockingjay with just a lot of fluff, a lot of wholesome scenes, just so I could feel a little bit better. If there's any place where existing stories are being remodeled, sampled and remixed to fit our current needs. It's fan fiction. It's fan fiction. Some very popular thing to do in fan fiction is an AU or alternate universe. For example, college AUs, which is a story of your favorite characters except they're in college or coffee shop AU, which is someone writing a story of characters from whatever TV series, book or something. And then they just have a coffee shop and, and they're just like making coffee. And it's like really cute. And there's fix it fix where people retell a chapter or an episode, except uh, for example, that traumatic death of your favorite character now doesn't happen. <laughs> Different point of view fix. For example, one of the most famous Hunger Games fan fictions is one that is just completely from the perspective of PETA. So it's just the complete trilogy, 
but from the perspective of Peta. Now that's a retelling if I've ever seen one. People love retelling existing stories. People love seeing the same story structure happen again and again, but with slight alterations each time. One coffee shop AU with Draco and Harry from Harry Potter. One coffee shop AU with your favorite anime characters. And another coffee shop AU with your favorite Minecraft streamers. It, it all exists. It all exists, trust me. If there's any two characters that you're a fan of that you can think of, I'm sure there is someone out there that has written a fanfiction of those two being baristas and making lattes. <laughs> there's been kind of a trend lately where a lot of very popular books published are written by authors who were very uh, prominent Raylo fanfiction writers. So for example, The Love Hypothesis is an example um, at first glance, this book seems to just be about, you know, a PhD romance story about a biology student getting her PhD and then her kind of older faculty research member. But if you look closer, you start seeing that these main characters really are Rey and Kylo Ren from Star Wars in a modern setting with different names. And actually what you're reading is Raylo Grad School AU slightly changed so it could be published because Ellie Hazelwood is known as a Raylo fanfiction writer. And this is not the only book published that is basically rebranded Raylo fanfic. Now some people hate this. Some people hate that publishers are basically publishing rebranded fanfiction. I think nature is healing and we are indeed, as Thomas Pettit theorized, going back to pre-printing press times, where we are just retelling stories constantly in slightly different ways, without being antsy about changing the original canon, but instead just letting the magic of stories run their course, slightly changing based on the person that's writing it or who the story is written for. Here's a really beautiful quote about the, the tradition of retelling fairy tales that I think we can also apply to fan fiction and maybe even to constantly retelling another enemies to lover story, another dark academia story. There is no such thing as an original or authentic tale. What distinguishes the great writers and storytellers is that they write and tell with a conscious effort to grab hold of tradition as if it were a piece of clay and to mold it and remold it to see what they can make of it for the present. They don't view traditions as ironclad, static or settled, but as supple and tangible. Basically, if you do it well, you can weave wonderful stories using common story patterns, even if they're a little overused. Now, how do you find the perfect fan fiction? There's thousands, th hundreds of thousands of them. Now, on the most popular fan fiction website, archive of our own or AO3 for short, there is a very good solution to this because they have a really great tagging system where every single fan fiction gets tagged, the author tags all the like common tropes and story structures that happen in their fan fiction. So it can be used as kind of an indexing system that when you're looking for a fan fiction, you can look up like, oh, I want this in my story and I want these characters and I want these tropes. And then you can do like a focus search. You know, when you're looking for fashion online and you're like, I'm looking for a top and I only want you to show me things that are available in size small and I only want to see the green and the red ones. This is this, this is how I look for clothes online, <laughs> clearly. Um, it's like that, but for fan fiction. Some of the tags that are very commonly used on AO3 are based on the structure and elements of the story, like enemies to lovers, fake dating, coffee shop AU. It could be emotional stuff like does it have angst or smut or fluff or is it just like a crazy crack fic? And these tags can even be fandom specific. For example, in the Harry Potter fan fiction space, there is a tag called Healer Hermione because a lot of people really like stories where Hermione is a healer or a medic. And of course, all the tags about whatever romantic pairing 
happens in the fanfiction. I think this is the most commonly searched fanfiction tags, which ship happens in it. You can be certain that every trope that you see mentioned often on TikTok has an AO3 tag equivalent and has been used on AO3 before TikTok was even a thing. These tags exist on AO3 to differentiate stories from each other, to highlight common patterns that people might be looking for. And this kind of reminds me of props structural analysis of Russian folktales or the indexing system of Arne Thompson. Of course, it's not the exact same, I know that, but I do feel like with this huge tag system on AO3, people have accidentally created a really good indexing system <laughs> that shows the common plot structures that appear in fanfictions. I think it's easy to look at fanfiction tags and just be like, oh, that's just like a dumb internet fanfiction thing. There are whole academic circles based around indexing the common structures of folktales. R.I.P. Vladimir Prop, you would have loved the tag system on AO3. <laughs> now this tag system has kind of seeped its way into other online fandom spaces. So when people talk about the books that they love online, they've been starting to use like fanfiction language. Originally these enemies to lovers fake dating trope tags were used on AO3 so you could find the fanfiction you want in the sea, the vast sea of fanfictions. But now a lot of people are talking about books on TikTok and with the internet at your fingertips and your TikTok for you page recommending a different book to you every single minute, you also become aware of just the thousands of books out there that you could be reading. How are you gonna differentiate between them? How are you gonna be able to kind of quickly make a decision of which ones deserve your attention? I think it's no surprise that this indexing system that exists on AO3 has kind of been co-opted by people on TikTok. So as a viewer, you can get like a quick idea of which books might be your thing and which books won't. And yeah, of course, you're not gonna get like the full complexities of what the book is about, but there are so many books that you come across, so many titles that you come across on the internet every single day. You gotta use something to like make a selection but we'll get more into that later. So yeah, this is my personal theory on why tropification has become so popular on TikTok. It's so people can like quickly differentiate between all those titles that they see every single day. But you know, the interesting thing about this, I think is that we can throw this idea that people are only reading tropes because it's been marketed to us or authors are only writing tropes because of the marketability we can kind of throw that idea out of the window because it's also happening in the most passion-driven, no money involved space on the internet and that is fan fiction. Clearly people love reading and writing the same story structures over and over again in fan fictions. Does that mean that all stories there or everyone who reads them is just like super shallow and doesn't want depth? I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of people who do think that. If, if you've ever read like a good fan fiction, you know that that's not true, okay? I don't think everyone who likes to read the same enemies to lovers fan fiction over and over again is shallow. I think this is more a sign. Stories, maybe, are more than just their tropes. And now you may be thinking, okay, this all sounds a little cold. Making this huge index of all plots in fairy tales, calling it story 510A, appraising books just through the lens of their bare bones. Gosh, how unromantic to say that all of these stories are kind of just the same. I mean, we've seen all those Cinderella stories may have the same tale type, but we, we've seen that the story of Little Settle Slut is very unique. If you're a fan fiction reader, you've probably had this happen to you where you find a story that perfectly has all the tags that you're looking for, and then the story just still sucks. Aren't stories more than just their structure? 
Let's look at history again, okay? Early in the 20th century, it became very popular in cultural analysis, media analysis, to focus on underlying rules and conventions, focusing on structure and universality. Like Vladimir Propin is, here are the 31 story elements of the folktale. It was very popular to categorize narrative and look at common patterns, which in turn was of course also criticized. Sorry, I had to get a new cup of tea. In 1958, Claude Lévi-Strauss, an anthropologist, published a reflection of the work of Vladimir Prop. So that's the guy that looked at Russian folktales and was like, there's 31 plot beats in folktales. And Lévi-Strauss accuses Prop of formalism. He says that his way of looking at fairy tales is way too focused on just the form, the different elements of the story. And he's just looking at narrative and like chopping it up in little bits. What does he even achieve with that? Lévi-Strauss believes that he's basically destroying the story that's being analyzed. Before the epoch of formalism, we were indeed unaware of what these tales have in common. Now we are deprived of any means of understanding how they differ. We have passed from the concrete to the abstract, but can no longer come down from the abstract to the concrete. He uses this beautiful metaphor about a tree that I really want to share. He says the American narrative sometimes mentioned trees, designating them as plum tree or apple tree. But it would be equally false to believe that only the concept tree is important, that its concrete realizations are arbitrary. What interests natives about the plum tree is its fecundity, while the apple tree attracts their attention because of the strength and depths of its roots. Even more criticism of this structuralist approach to narrative analysis came from Roland Barthes when he published in 1970 an essay called SZ. In the opening, he critiques how others have previously analyzed story narratives. He's talking about the trend of categorizing every story in terms of narrative elements like Prop did. What the first analysts of narrative were attempting is to see all the world stories in a single structure. We shall, they thought, extract from each tale its model, and then out of these models we shall make a great narrative structure, which we shall reapply to any one narrative. A task as exhausting as it is ultimately undesirable, for the text thereby loses its difference when we're trying to understand stories based on their common structure, we will eventually just shoot ourselves in the foot because it makes us lose our understanding of the magic of individual stories. This structural lens is essentially unifying every story into one. It's the same thing you might say about tropes. If you're only looking at books in terms of whether they have enemies to lovers or friends to lovers. You're looking at these books based on what they have in common with other books. And then every book kind of starts sounding the same if you look at it that way. Now, even though these academics have probably never heard of TikTok and they would probably have an aneurysm if you try to explain to them what a grumpy ex-sunshine small town romance with cottagecore vibes is. But what they said is not dissimilar to the criticisms people are bringing up against the tropification of books on TikTok. I love it when the arguments that people bring up about TikTok discussions are similar to the stuff academics from a century ago were writing about. It's my favorite form of history repeating itself. I found that the most common critique of an overuse of tropes on TikTok is that it's going to cause a collectivizing of stories. It's reducing wonderful, unique stories to a simple, common trait. Catherine Lee writes, even if two books both feature the enemies to lovers trope, they may explore it in different ways, especially if they fall under different genres. This nuance is lost when multiple books are subjectively categorized by a single user in a single video as enemies to lovers books. And Archiska Pathak writes, when books become tropified, they lose their individuality. They can be nothing less and more often than not, nothing more. The hours upon hours that authors have put into their work will become watered down to a phrase used to define hundreds of other books. 
this TikToker is talking about how they're disappointed that wonderful and complex books like The Poppy War are being described with tropes. It makes it so generic sounding, but it's truly a standout. It's just been reduced to being morally gray or grumpy sunshine or enemies to lovers. Just everything has been watered down so much that I feel like everything is losing its meaning. Like Barth said about applying a great narrative pattern to every story out there, the text loses its difference. R.I.P. Roland Barthes, you would have hated the tropification on TikTok. So 20th century academics and modern TikTokers would agree. <laughs> Focusing only on the structure or the tropes of a story completely strips it from all its meaning and aesthetic merit. It removes the individual experience of the reader. It unifies and makes us appraise stories solely based on what it shares with other stories, thereby completely demystifying a work of art until you're only left with the bare naked bones without the beating heart of the story or anything to hold on to. So what's the alternative then? A lot of people say we need to go back to just giving plot summaries, but isn't the simple recounting of what happens in the plot at the beginning kind of doing the same. You're also reducing the magic of the story to just its plot structure. Before we start talking about like alternatives to this structural way of looking at books, I do want to say that, you know, I don't think it's always bad to talk about a book in a way that doesn't fully encompass every little complex detail about the story you can't, right? Like when I say, here's a list of all of my favorite fantasy books. Obviously these books are more than just their genre. Of course you understand that, but you're not gonna look at this and sit there and be like, oh, I can't believe you're reducing these books to just their genre. You understand that I'm saying fantasy books just like as a quick jumping off point if you're looking for fantasy books. We understand that I probably have more complex thought about these books other than it's fantasy and we understand that these books probably have more complexities other than it's fantasy. I'm just trying to give you a quick recommendation. Or when publishers put those like taglines on books that is like, wait, this one actually has one. I know this one's described as the invisible life of Eddie LaRue meets life of Pi. Obviously that also doesn't like encompass every beautiful complex detail of the wonder of that story, but it's just a quick way to get your attention. You get an idea of what the book is about. And I think we should view this tropification as something similar. It's just a jumping off point. Remember when I said that my theory is that this tropification of TikTok happened or was taken over from fan fiction because it's like an easy way for you to get through the endless sea of book recommendations that you can find on TikTok. We would be here forever if every single book title you came across online had to be accompanied by like an in-depth review. Like these in-depth reviews need to exist, don't get me wrong, I love them, it's beautiful and it needs to exist somewhere, but not everywhere. And now I can already hear you thinking, I can hear you thinking, okay, but aren't there other ways to do that? Aren't there better ways to do a quick book recommendation? Because tropes just focus on structure and didn't we just establish that only focusing on structure kind of makes you lose the magic of the book? You are correct. So what are some other ways that we could talk about books? Maybe we could talk about themes like, oh, this book deals with themes of motherhood. This is more coming of age. But even that I would say is kind of a description of structure. I'm really interested in hearing like your theories on this. And there's probably like many answers to this question. Personally, I think there are two examples of how this non-structure approach to talking about books is already happening on TikTok itself, okay? There's not just bad things happening on TikTok. The first one is discussing books based on the emotional experience. There are so many videos of people recommending books in the style of, these are books that made me cry, books that made me feel less alone in my 20s. 
There's no mention of the structure of the book, the plot, there's no talking about themes. It's just a focus on the experience that it will give you, the emotional experience they will give you as the reader. I think this is interesting because it's decentering the story and instead putting the emphasis on the reader. The reviewer is no longer some faceless, unbiased observer of the story, but on the internet nowadays there's a lot more space for the interplay between the book and its reader. How a book can make you emotional, how a book can give you solace in trying times, or how a book is a perfect palate cleanser after like a dense but beautiful literary read. And yes, even people giving spice meters to book that they're recommending spicy books, that also falls under this category and I think it's a cool thing to talk about books in terms of the effect that it has on you as the reader. You're like an active participant in whether the book is good or not. And the second way of talking about books that doesn't involve any story structure is I think my favorite new way. I'm just gonna show it to you, okay? I'm gonna show you this video of someone recommending a book and let me know what you think of it, what like your first impression of it is. It's recommending a book based on aesthetics. What are you thinking? Maybe you're thinking, oh, that's just TikTok being shallow only focusing on the aesthetics of things instead of the contents. But am I wrong that what you're seeing here is something that could only happen because of our modern times? Traditionally, book critics had to write what they thought about a book using only the written word, like in a newspaper or on blogs. Even in modern times when we're talking about books on YouTube or on Instagram or on TikTok, we're still using, you know, our spoken words to talk about literature. Maybe use a cheeky little gif in a review. But what is happening on TikTok is people are talking about books using no words and only images and music. That is cool, okay? <laughs> people are using a whole new visual and musical language to recommend a book to you. Like, you cannot tell me that that is a cool thing that's happening. <laughs> we just established that talking about a book solely in terms of structure doesn't capture the complexity of a story. We still miss the magic woven into it. It's a magic that just cannot be expressed with a list of tropes or a summary of the plot. We've all experienced raving about a book we love to a friend and then realizing that our awkward words just cannot properly convey why they should definitely read that book too. So I love it when people are trying new ways to discuss the stories we love. Ways that don't fit into the traditional reviewing conventions. And yes, one of these new ways that kind of emerged on TikTok is talking about books in terms of tropes. Maybe not the most elegant thing, but like I said, I do think there are some pros to it. It makes it easy to find new books. But a lot of new things are happening on TikTok and a lot of n other new ways of talking about books are emerging there as well, okay? Not everything that happens on TikTok is dumb and stupid. Some of it is, but not everything. That's what I wanted to say. So if you wanna watch me awkwardly try to recommend books to you, subscribe to this channel because that's what I usually do. <laughs> I want to give a special thanks to all of my patrons for supporting me with a special shout out to all of my elite Patreon member and a warm welcome to all of the newest elite members. We have Agatha Pijanowska, Marcel, Anya Richardson, Hannah Liu and Chelsea Tipton. Welcome! I really hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and I will see you soon with another video next week. Goodbye!